uh, want to welcome to the pulpit one more time uh, Pastor Tony Cook as he comes to minister the gospel Amen. tonight. Thank you, Pastor. Bless you, sir. Thank you for <laughs> It's good to be here. Thank you. Don't you appreciate Pastor Michael and Tony? You've got great leaders here, and, and just I appreciate the atmosphere you're leading your people into the presence of God. And, uh, thank you for your help. That'll help us. Uh, we've got uh, four nations lined up next year, and we'll probably line up several more. Um, going to Guatemala for a pastor's conference, and um, well, Turkey, we're doing a tour type thing, but um, uh, Germany and England as well, or Austria and England, and we'll probably be adding several more nations on top of that. I want to mention real quickly uh, some of our books. Uh, my publisher contacted me right at the very outset of the coronavirus update. And they said, Tony, we're contacting our various authors and asking them to put together short books uh, that people can read quickly. They said, so many people are dealing with fear and anxiety and do you have something that you could put together? And so I put together, I wrote this in eight days, which is not a big deal, it's a short book. Um, but it, it was a message I'd been preaching anyway. I'd, I'd been led to preach on this from the 23rd Psalm. Because the Lord is my shepherd, uh, the 12 blessings of an empowered life. And there's six verses in the 23rd Psalm. And there are 12 distinct blessings articulated that are released into us when the Lord really, not just when we say the Lord is my shepherd, but when the Lord is our shepherd. And we're allowing him to lead us and guide us and feed us and and care for us. So I want to give this to somebody who will give it to somebody else. All right. I saw your hand there. For, would you be so kind to run it back to that kind lady in the blue blouse? And um, just appreciate people. That actually, that book, I didn't think about this, but that book is, is a super easy. If you know somebody that's just struggling, it's a tough year, tough time, tough situations. There's a lot of help and encouragement in that. And then another book I wrote last year is called What Would Jesus Say? Lessons from the Letters to the Seven Churches of Revelation. And um, that, to me, that's one of the most fascinating sections in, in the Bible because it's, it's the, the last book of the Bible that was written. John wrote the book of Revelation in the mid to late 90s. And um, Jesus talks to seven churches, Ephesus and Smyrna and all those and uh, he talks to them about what they're doing right, what they can improve on. He's very encouraging. He, he commends them. He, he praises six of the seven churches for good things they're doing right. But he also tells five of the seven churches, you know what? I appreciate you, but you could do this a little bit better. How many of you know that when the Lord corrects us, it's not because he hates us, it's because he loves us? And he just wants us to help take our game to the next level. I think, I think what would Jesus say should be given to somebody who's going to Jesus school. What about that? You think that's all right? You want to come? Uh, what would Jesus say? Hope you enjoy that. Hope you enjoy your schooling. And then uh, what I'm preaching from today and tonight is miracles in the supernatural through church history. Who drove the farthest to be here? Who drove a good ways? We're pointing at somebody. How far did somebody? How far did you drive? Thirty minutes. Did anybody drive further than thirty minutes? How far did you drive? About thirty-one minutes. No, no, I'm kidding. You said forty. Thirty and a half. Yeah, we just need to beat her. That's all we need to do. So, anybody drive further than forty minutes? Nobody drove further. So, sir, come on up and grab this. That's what you get for driving a long way. Appreciate you coming. And this book, what we're covering in these sessions is really, uh, it, what we're covering in the book is far more detailed, far more extensive uh, than what is in the book. And so we hope you, uh, those of you that get that in July, we've sold out of a couple items. And so if, if you, you want something that's not there, just order it, pay for it, and we will ship it. We will not charge you for shipping. We will absorb that. So just work with the... Uh, wonderful ladies working at the table. Uh, can we put up the slide that we were going to be ready for next? And is Mookie still in here? Did Mookie have, I, I may need your help, Mookie, because some of these names are French, okay? So do we have Bernard of uh, 
Okay, we're gonna. I'm, I'm gonna skip several. I think in the second service today, uh, Tony said she's gonna make the announcements like an auctioneer, and uh, so I may teach like an auctioneer. So I'm. Let's, let's go back. Let's do Novation real quick. Uh, he was he was an elder in Rome, um, and he again the middle middle of the third century. The Holy Spirit is the one who places prophets in the church, instructs teachers, directs tongues. If anybody ever tells you, well, tongues passed away when the last apostle died. No, they're talking about that well into further centuries. Gives powers and healings and so on. Uh, and he talks about orders and arranges other gifts of the charismata, the charismatic gifts. Makes the Lord's church everywhere uh, perfect and complete. Now, this next one, Mookie, I need some help on the name of this town. Uh, Bernard, uh, 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 I'm sorry, could we go back one? Go back one maybe? I may have my order messed up. Go back one more. If we could go back. Yeah, help me out on Bernard of Clairvaux. It's not Clairvox. Okay, very good. I actually did this seminar in Nice, France, and so they were correcting me on all my bad pronunciations. But Bernard of Clairvaux, he was much later. Um, you know, he. we're now into the, uh, uh, you know, into the... Uh, what is that, the 11th century, I guess. And so, again, this thing is not stopping. This move of the Holy Spirit, this working. The Holy Spirit communicates himself for the working of miracles and signs and wonders and other supernatural operations, which he effects by the hands of whomever he pleases. Now, look at this. Renewing the wonders of bygone times. Meaning... Now, now, see, all this time, I, I'm just showing you kind of like we're jumping from mountain peak to mountain peak. There were always groups that were just getting hyper-traditional, ritualistic, formalistic, that were not having any workings of the Spirit. But there were all, whenever there were people open and hungry and desiring, like I said, the Holy Spirit's a gentleman. If, if you don't want any of that, if you just want to have ritual, and he'll, he'll back up and let you have ritual. But, but everybody that was hungering, the Holy Spirit would come in and he would renew. What did, what did Bernard say? He would renew the wonders of bygone times so that the events of the present may confirm our belief as to those of the past. June 9th, 1977, when my back got instantly and immediately healed, you know, one of my first thoughts was, oh my gosh, this is the kind of stuff that happened in the Bible. See, I'd read about, you know, we'd always heard Bible stories about people getting healed, but nobody that I knew of in the, what was that, the 20th century. You know you're getting old when you, well, now which century is this, the 20th century? <laughs> nobody in the 20th century that I knew of had had that, and all of a sudden my back is instantly healed, which may have seemed like a small thing to somebody, but it wasn't a small thing to me. I'd been in pain for two years. And uh, all of a sudden, my thought was, that's the same kind of thing that happened in the Bible. Uh, so that the events of the present may confirm our belief as to those of the past. He has bestowed on them for their benefit, uh, for miracle working, for salvation, for help, for consolation, and for fervor. Let's go ahead and skip ahead, if we can. The next slide, please. Uh, Peter Waldo, now guess where he was from, uh, Mookie? He was from Lyon. Am I saying that right? Lyon. Yeah, I just said lion and they said, no, it's Lyon. So he was from France also. You know what's interesting to me? And I love the French people. I've preached in Paris. I've preached in Nice. I've preached in uh, another city that was over north of Zurich, Switzerland, no, it wasn't. It was north of Geneva. Um, you know the, uh, what's that mineral water? Um, not Perrier. Avion. Avion. I, it was very close to Avion. Is that, a, is that a town in France, Avion? I preach very close to Avion, France. And there's just some wonderful people that love Jesus. But by and large, you know, the, the general French culture has become very um, ultra-humanistic and... Uh, 
you know, not, not, not at all favorable toward religion. I don't know if you know this, but the Cathedral of Notre Dame in France, <coughs> around the time of the French Revolution, uh, they turned that into basically a pagan temple for a time. Uh, they turned it into the temple of reason as opposed to being a church to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. And so again, no, no anti-national sentiment. I'm just saying it's interesting to me that starting with uh, Irenaeus of Lyon, Peter Waldo, Bernard of Clairvaux, and, now, uh, and, and different ones that, that uh, I may not be covering here but are in the book, uh, God did some powerful outpourings in France. And uh, Peter Waldo, again, was in the 1100s and into the 1200s. But his group, they were called the Waldensians, and they were actually kind of a form of early Protestants. Uh, probably, what, three or 400 years, maybe 300 years before Martin Luther. Martin Luther wasn't really the first reformer, um, but his kind of took and spread everywhere. So, but there was much reformation taking place long before Martin Luther in Germany. But the Waldensians came out with this statement, therefore concerning the anointing of the sick, uh, we hold it as an article of faith and profess sincerely from the heart that sick persons, when they ask it, may lawfully be anointed with anointing oil by one who joins them in praying that it may be effective to the healing of the body and, and so on. So they actually were praying for the sick, anointing people and that type of thing. And um, so, again, I'm just wanting you to see there's this continuous stream through the centuries uh, that, that people were going back and saying, you know, what, we need to get back to what the Bible says. We need to get back to get away from the traditions of men and practice what the Bible says. Let's go to the next one if we can. Uh, and we're getting a little bit closer to more modern times. Martin Luther, everybody knows of him in one way, shape, or form. And Martin Luther was actually preaching in the year 1523 on a verse. And tell, somebody tell me what this is, John 14, 12. Pastor, you're not allowed to participate because you just preached or mentioned this this morning. Anybody know what John 14, 12 says? That's where Jesus said, Verily I say to you, he who believes on me, the works that I do shall you do also. And greater works than these shall you do because I go to the Father. Jesus said that the church, believing ones, would do the works he did and greater works because he was going to the Father. Here's what Martin Luther said when he was preaching on that verse. We must allow these words to remain and not gloss over them as some have done who said that these signs were manifestations of the Spirit in the beginning of the Christian era and that now they have ceased. He said that is not right for the same power is in the church still. Say this without, out loud with me. Say, the same power, the same power. Is, in the is in the church still. See, when Jesus rose from the dead and poured out the Holy Spirit, there were no instructions given to the, given to the Holy Spirit like this, that God and Jesus said, now, Holy Spirit, we want you to go down now. And, and man, go full power until John dies. And then trim it back. <laughs> and then just go at 42%, you know, for the rest of the church age. Now, when the Spirit was given, the Spirit was given. And he's the same. Jesus is the same. And Martin Luther, man, they were coming out of a period of, of horrendous uh, spiritual darkness. People were paying money to buy forgiveness. And, you know, he just said no. And that's why that whole thing got started. And, uh, but he said, the same power is in the church still. He said, we do not agree with the people who say that that was true for the early church. But now that that has ceased, he said, that is not right. One time Martin Luther got a letter, and this is all documented. He got a letter from a pastor in another community. 
And, uh, of course, they didn't have tech. He couldn't get a text or email or cell phone call. He got a physical letter from another pastor that said, look, we've got this person here. Uh, they're in desperate condition. The doctors can't do anything for them, and, uh, and, and we don't know what to do. Here's what Martin Luther said. This is his response. This next slide. He wrote that pastor and said this, talking about the condition of that individual. This must be counteracted by the power of Christ and with the prayer of faith. This is what we do, and we have been accustomed to it. For a cabinet maker here was similarly afflicted with madness, and we cured him by prayer in Christ's name. I think that's pretty, pretty powerful. Uh, let's move ahead. I know we've got uh, uh, hundreds of years yet to go. I anybody ever hear of the Quakers? It, does anybody here have a friend who's part of the Quaker movement? I see a hand here. Cooper Beatty, one of our teachers at Rama, was a Quaker. And more often now they're called the Friends, uh, the Friends Society. But they called them the Quakers in part uh, because... Uh, individuals in their meetings would get under the power of God. The power of God would come on them, and they would literally shake under the power of God. And George Fox, who is the founder of that group, said this. He said, the Lord's power broke forth, and I had great openings and prophecies and spoke unto them of the things of God, which they heard with attention and silence, and they went away and spread the fame thereof. Many great and wonderful things were wrought or produced by the heavenly power in the, those days. For the Lord made bare his omnipotent arm and manifested his power to the astonishment of many by the healing virtue whereby many have been delivered from great infirmities and the devils were made subject through his name. So they had th these things that we have today, kind of like in the charismatic movement, different signs and manifestations and things like that. They, there's, they're not anything new. Uh, you've had these kind of outpourings. And, and one of the phrases I love there, it kind of in the middle of that, he said, uh, for the Lord made bare his omnipotent arm. Do you know how the early church prayed? They prayed, Lord, stretch out your hand. And, and heal through, you know, the name of your servant Jesus. And enable your servants to speak the word with all boldness. See, there, there, in many cases, the expectation is such an important part. And, and Pastor Michael, I don't know if it was the first or second service, but this morning, Pastor Michael made a statement that was, I mean, it was gold. He said many people, and I'm going to probably not say it exactly as well as he did, not, maybe not use the exact same words. He said many people short circuit receiving from God because they go around saying, well, I've been prayed for and nothing happened. None of this ever works for me. I've heard all these and nothing ever works for me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the Bible says you will have what you say. And um, what we need to say, what we need to be saying is the word of God is true, the word of God is powerful, and the word of God works in my life. And, and if that becomes our regular, not just saying it ritualistically or religiously, but from our heart, believing it, you say, well, I haven't seen that yet. Well, see, that's what faith is, calling those things which maybe you've never experienced you know, calling those things which be not as though they are and believing that you will have the things that you say when you believe those things and, and you speak them. And, and so, anyway, George Fox, just a, a great example here. One of, next slide, one of his evangelists, you know, because any time that we talk about one of these guys, they're the key leader, but usually there were dozens of other people that were doing similar things that were maybe part of the same team that maybe just weren't as famous. Um, Edward Burroughs was one of his friends and ev fellow evangelists, and he talked about the meetings that happened under George Fox. 
the founder of the Quakers, he said, we received often the pouring down of the Spirit upon us and the gift of God's holy eternal Spirit as in the days of old. And our hearts were made glad and our tongues loosed and our mouths opened and we spoke with new tongues as the Lord gave us utterance and as his Spirit led us, which was poured down upon us upon, uh, on sons and daughters." So they're describing in the Quaker movement, which actually started in England, then spilled over to the states, particularly to Pennsylvania. William Penn uh, uh, was a Quaker and a good friend of, of George Fox. Let's move ahead. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, Nicholas Zinzendorf, isn't that a fun name to say? And that's really not even his full name. That's, uh, that's the short version. He was actually Count... Nicholas von Zinzendorf. He was a, a real high society guy in, um, in Germany, East Germany. I think they call that uh, Moravia. He, he was a really wealthy guy. He inherited tons of money from his parents. And he loved the Lord. And there was a group, uh, you know, we talked about the, um, the Afghanis, the Christians and all that. There was a group that went back to, uh, const well, actually they went back to the Czech Republic, Prague, uh, called, the, uh, they were the followers of John Huss. John Huss uh, was a hundred years before Martin Luther, so he would have been put to death. He was burned at the stake uh, because he would not renounce the things he had taught from the Bible, which were basically the things that Martin Luther preached a hundred years later. Uh, that we are justified by faith, not by works, and not by paying money to get forgiveness and different things like that. Well, he had a group of followers, so they would have been back in the fort, like around 1425. And his followers, they called them Hussites because John Huss was their leader. Uh, they also called them uh, the Moravians or the United Brethren. And um, actually, they didn't call them the Moravians till later. They called them the United Brethren, and they were persecuted for centuries. And they went from country to country, community to community, and they finally show up in uh, 1720. So that would have been 15, 16, 300 years after their founder was burned at the stake. They showed up at the estate of Nicholas Zinzendorf because they heard that he was a really wealthy Christian, that he had a lot of land, and they basically showed up on his doorstep and said, we've been chased from country to country, we've been persecuted in all these places, could we establish a settlement here? And Nicholas von Zinzendorf said, yes, you can, and just allowed them to build. I mean, he had so much land, they just built a town right there. And, and it was called Hernhut which I think is German for the Lord's watch or the Lord oversees. And in the 17, what was it, 1727, they had an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It was called the Moravian Pentecost. And um, here's what Zinzendorf said about this. He said, to believe against hope is the root of the gift of miracles. And I owe this testimony to our beloved church that apostolic powers are there manifested. We have had undeniable proofs in the healing of maladies in themselves incurable, such as cancers, consumptions, tuberculosis, when the patient was in the agonies of death all by means of prayer or of a single word. They had an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They, this group, the Moravians, the early Protestants, Luther, Calvin, and all that, they, didn't, they had no vision for world evangelism. They, just, they were so fixed on, we've got to reform the church. And they actually kind of believed that it was really the apostles of the first century. Well, they kind of already went into all the world and preached the gospel. So we don't really need to do that. And uh, so we'll just, we'll just clean up the church. But, but Zinzendorf had a vision for world evangelism. 
for world missions. And I think maybe I've got some of the um, numbers here. Uh, anybody here heard of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania? Is that east? Is that east? Either I was spirit-led or I got really lucky just then. We'll just say I was led, maybe. But uh, first of all, here's what the Moravians did, this group. And they were not a massive group. Uh, but they started a prayer meeting 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it ended up lasting 100 years. And they began sending out missionaries Nobody was sending, uh, very, very little. But in, in, in they launched 232 missions, established more than 30 international settlements uh, based on the model there of prayer, worship, and simple communal living. Uh, two notable American settlements still in existence today are Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, founded by Zinzendorf, on Christmas Eve of 1741, and Old Salem in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Now, the, the Moravians did a lot of good stuff, but let's go to the next slide, because if it were not for Nicholas Zinzendorf, you would have never heard of John Wesley. The Moravians had a tremendous influence in Wesley's life. How many of you here grew up Methodist or Nazarene or some holiness movement. They say that John Wesley is kind of the, not, not the official founder, but that 42 different denominations came out of his influence. You know, primarily the Methodist church, which right now is going through, uh, uh, and I say this with great love because my mom was a Methodist. I married a Methodist. I got saved at a Methodist youth camp. I got filled with the Holy Spirit in a Methodist sanctuary, that's where that meeting took place. Um, gosh, I don't know what else, uh, but, but I love the Methodists, but, but like every organization, they, they get away from their original fire and, they, and the, they can drift away from the Bible and all kinds of things. And, uh, but, but when Wesley first started, he was an Anglican priest. He was Oxford educated. And he came to, he, he, he didn't understand, even, no matter how, do you know you can be so smart and you miss the ABCs? He was, he was an Oxford professor of religion and uh, an Anglican priest. His dad was an Anglican priest, but he did not know if he was saved or not. Because in his mind, it was about works. It was about how holy you are, how disciplined you are, how many good works you do, things of that nature. And he decided, I don't know if you know this, but John Wesley came to America when America was still the colonies. And he spent, was it three years in Georgia, Savannah, uh, as a missionary to the Native Americans and he, he, at the end of it, he wrote, I came to America to save the Indians, but who shall save me? Because he still didn't know. And he, on the ship over, he had this terrifying experience. He was the chaplain of the ship coming to Savannah from England. And the, store, the ship got in a horrible storm. The main mast of the ship snapped. It really looked like the ship was going down. And he, really, he found himself terrified of death because he did not know if he had been good enough. Have I done enough good works? And, and he hears singing down in the belly of the ship. He's singing. And it's joyful singing. It's praise. It's faith-filled. It was a group of Moravian missionaries. And it bothered him. That, that they had peace and faith. And, and afterwards, he said to one of the guys, he said, weren't you afraid? He said, we were not afraid. Well, weren't the women and children? No, we were not afraid. We knew that if that ship went down, we we're going to see Jesus. And it bothered him because he knew they don't have the education I have, but they have something I don't have. So he had various interactions with uh, Moravians over the years. And... Um, Here's what happened. Uh, he had gone, he, he had had an experience where he knew he was born again. 
And what he did was he went and spent a few months with Zinzendorf in Germany and saw the outpouring of the Spirit there, the prayer meetings there, the presence of God there, the healings there. And he comes back to London and they have, do you ever do, I don't know if you do them or not, but a New Year's, you know, where you pray in the New Year. And, 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 they, and he said at about three in the morning, as we were continuing instant in prayer, the power of God came mightily upon us in so much that many cried out for exceeding joy and many fell to the ground as soon as we were recovered a little. You know you've had a good church service when you have to recover from it, okay? As soon as we were recovered a little from the, that awe and amazement at the presence of his majesty, we broke out with one voice. We praise thee, O God. We acknowledge thee to be the Lord. I've spent, I don't know, a lot of time. John Wesley's journals and writings on my bookcase are about like that. And I have not read every word, but I've read a lot of it. And, man, the guy talks about answered prayer. He talks about praying for people that get healed. He talked about praying for his horse when his horse had a bad, you know, foot and was having trouble. He rode by horseback everywhere, so his horse was really important to him. And, uh, I mean, he just talks about tons of supernatural outpouring, manifestations of the Spirit, healings and miracles and things like that. We have another slide on Wesley, I believe. Um, this is so powerful today because right now the Methodists are in the midst of a massive split. And they're splitting between the traditional United Methodist versus a new group. And I think of various groups, but the predominant one is a group called the, the Global Methodist Movement, which is tending to much more embrace the Bible as the Word of God and the Bible is the standard for, you know, and the other group is going with, um, you know, the, the extreme uh, liberal agenda of, you know, homosexual clergy and performing uh, same-sex marriage and things like that. And it's so interesting because in Wesley's day and, and further, holiness unto the Lord. Holiness was such a powerful theme. And here's what Wesley said. It's, I think it's proving very prophetic. He said, I am not afraid that the people called Methodists should ever cease to exist either in Europe or America, but I am afraid lest they should only exist as a dead sect having the form of religion without the power. And this undoubtedly will be the case unless they hold fast both the doctrine, spirit, and discipline with which they first set out. I think that's pretty amazing. So let's move on. Next slide. Um, we want to come. How many of you think it's time to come to America? All right. Well, while Wesley was doing his thing in England, he had one little short trip to uh, Savannah, Georgia early, but he was predominantly, you know, 99% in uh, England. Uh, at the same time, Jonathan Edwards, I think they were born the same year, uh, Jonathan Edwards was leading a church in uh, was it Massachusetts, it was in Massachusetts and um, Northampton, and they had, uh, he was kind of the, the main theologian of the what's called the Great Awakening in America. Um, George Whitfield, the evangelist, came over from England. He was the evangelist of the Great Awakening, but uh, Edwards was the theologian of the Great Awakening. Every, every theologian knows him. He, many consider him to be the most important theologian ever to live on the American continent. Uh, he is respected, revered. You may not have heard of him, but you probably heard of a sermon he preached called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Do you ever hear of that sermon? Man, it shook the daylights out of people. And people think that, well, he preached sinners, and he must have been one of these wild-eyed, raving, lunatic preachers. No, he was hyper-educated. He read his sermons calmly. He never raised his voice he, he literally read his sermons. He was very calm. But um, when he would preach some of these sermons, the power of God would fall. 
And, uh, and not all of his men, just there were seasons of revival that happened. But there would be times in Edward's meetings where people, what we would call being slain in the spirit or falling under the power of God. He had people sometimes that would be slain in the spirit for 24 hours. They would fall out while he was preaching. And, you know, can, so can you imagine... You know, somebody falling out during this morning sermon, and by tomorrow morning they're still just lying there. You know, and uh, and and people would come from nearby communities just to come look at these people. How long they've been down there? You know, ah, sixteen hours. You know, they didn't even get up to go to the bathroom. Nope, nope. And and but when they would come to, boy, they would have seen heaven, or they would have had some spiritual experience, or whatever. But, but Edward said the town seemed to be full of the presence of God. There was scarcely a single person in the town, old or young, left unconcerned about the great things of the eternal world. You know, we hear a lot of things about revival, and that probably means a lot of things to different people. But really, for most of these leaders, revival never just meant the Christians getting excited and getting blessed. It meant the Spirit of God being poured out in such a way that it did bless and excite the saints, but it impacted all of society, the community. People were brought under conviction of sin and repented and got right with God. Here's something else that Edward said. Let's look at the next screen. Um, these guys were so eloquent. They said things in such a fancy way. Like I might say, yeah, so-and-so got prayed for, and the power of God hit him, and he fell down. Well, that's not how Jonathan Edwards said it. He said, therefore, it is not at all, a strange, it is not at all strange that God should sometimes give his saints such foretastes of heaven as to diminish their bodily strength. So if you ever have bring a friend to church and somebody gets prayed for and falls down and all that, uh, don't and they say, what just happened? You know, don't just say, oh, they got slain in the spirit. No, say, it's not strange that God gave his, this person such a foretaste of heaven that their bodily strength was simply diminished. Uh, maybe don't explain it that way because they like, what? What are you saying? Uh, let's move ahead, if we could. Edward Irving, back in England, uh, they had a charismatic run, a charismatic movement speaking in tongues. They began to understand tongues as a devotional prayer language, not simply a means of, you know, like on Pentecost, preaching so that people hear the gospel in their own language. And he made this statement uh, if they ask for an explanation of the fact that these powers have ceased in the church, meaning Pentecostal, you know, powers of the gifts of the Spirit, he said, my answer is, they may have decayed just as faith and holiness have decayed, but that they have ceased is not a matter so clear. See, if you're going to make the argument, well, I've been in church all my life and I've never seen anybody healed, therefore healing must not exist. Do you know you can go to church some places and, and uh, you'll never see any evangelism? Does that mean evangelism has ceased? You know, the fact that, that a group has not experienced something doesn't mean that God has changed his heart and his attitude. Uh, let's move ahead. Let's move ahead. We're going to come back to America. Doesn't he look happy? <laughs> now, we're in Ohio. Where is Oberlin? Does anybody know where Oberlin College is in Ohio? Southwest Ohio. Finney ended up being the president of Oberlin. And at the time, I don't know where the university is now, but at the time, you know, he was a fire-breathing evangelist. He described one of his experiences. He, he, pre, he was connected with what we call the Second Great Awakening in America, uh, his involvement was primarily up in the Northeast, especially New York, a little bit over into New England. Uh, but his, his meetings, um, he had, one time he was preaching and 400 people fell out. Uh, they have records from some of his meetings that when he would preach, like 
everybody in town got saved. The, the mayors, the judges, you know, not just, not just one class, you know, middle class, lower class, everybody, upper, middle, lower. And some of the police uh, from some of the cities that he preached in, uh, the police had nothing to do for months because all the criminals got saved. Crime stopped. You know, taverns shut down, saloons shut down because people were... But, but his personal experience, uh, he said, I received a mighty baptism of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit descended upon me in a matter, manner that seemed to go through me, body and soul. I could feel the impression like a wave of electricity going through and through me. Indeed, it seemed to come in waves and waves of liquid love, for I could not express it in any other way way. Finney's ministry was so powerful. Uh, it's just, he, he, he literally shook the, the eastern half of the nation. Let's move ahead. We're going to pop back to Germany here. This is a guy I had not heard of until just a few years ago, but his name was uh, Johann Blumhardt. He, it was in Germany, and he opened up. He began to pray for the sick and saw people get healed, and so he began to open up homes for sick people to come and they would minister to them for days and days, Bible study, prayer, then pray for the sick, and so on. And he, but he said, has he changed any? Talking about Jesus, certainly not. He traveled from place to place doing good and healing so that all subsequent generations could trust him and so that all who are miserable and afflicted might always know where to turn for help. Jesus still does wonderful things going around and doing good and healing, even if it's more, in more inconspicuous ways. He draws close to anyone in need and pain so that we too might experience firsthand that he is the one who knows how to help us. Still today, Jesus works good and heals. And he had a healing center in Germany that people came to from all over. Let's go to the next slide. And this is something he said. I'm not going to take time to read it. Let's go to the next slide if we could. The auctioneer showing up. Dorothea Trudell, she was, how many of you have never heard of her? I'd never heard of her either. But in, in the research and the studies on this, you know what? She was not a preacher. You know what she was? She was a florist. She had a florist shop near Zurich, Switzerland. She was a Swiss lady. And plague came through. You know, we're kind of shocked about coronavirus, but in world history, plagues went through, gosh, they were not uncommon. And um, we've got a pretty low mortality rate. Now, this is not to take anything away. If you've lost a loved one to COVID, I'm not trying to minimize that. Or if you have a friend who's struggling uh, or if you've struggled. But, you know, we're talking about some of these European plagues and plagues in different parts of the world. They'd knock out 30% of the population. Germany went through a period where, well, they had the 30-year war and they had plagues and famine. Germany, in one 30-year period, the population went from 16 million to 6 million in one 30-year period. So I'm not trying to minimize, you know, the pain and suffering that people have felt, but this is a pretty low-key thing compared to some of these that have knocked out 30, some 40% of the population, you know, with that kind of mortality rate. Well, long story short, Dorothea grew up in a, in a home. Her father was an alcoholic and... Uh, you know, didn't provide for the family, and the mother uh, raising the children, uh, all she could do was pray for her kids. When they got sick, they had no money to go to a doctor, so they'd just pray for the kids, and the kids would get healed. Um, and this plague comes through Switzerland, and all she had five employees as a, heading up a florist business. All five of her employees got the plague. She remembered how her mom used to pray for her and how that she would anoint with oil. And so she calls these five sick employees together and reads James 5, 16, 17 to them and says, I want to pray for you and anoint you with oil. Well, all five of them got healed. And, and the word started spreading and people started coming to her from everywhere. And uh, she ended up having buying three different houses 
beyond the one she lived in. She bought three houses, and people were coming from all over. Well, a doctor got jealous and charged her with uh, practicing medicine without a license, and she got shut down. And she appealed it, lost the appeal. She appealed again. I I think she appealed like three times. She finally got to the Supreme Court, or what they would call, what we would call the Supreme Court in Zurich, Switzerland. And uh, she had a good attorney helping her that final time. And what they did was they arranged 100 testimonies of people who had gotten healed. And many of the people who testified were the doctors of these people who had gotten healed. And so this is recorded in the court system, in the court records in Zurich, Switzerland, yet today. And the judge said, well, it's, uh, you're not practicing medicine. You're practicing faith. You're, and they gave her the clearance, and she opened up, and, uh, and God just used her in a remarkable way. And, and all they did was in these homes, they would get people together. They'd have Bible studies. They'd build their faith. They'd teach them how to receive by faith. And then they'd pray for them. And, and it was a pretty remarkable thing. We come across, let's go to the next slide. Uh, Dr. Charles Cullis in Boston heard about what was happening with Bloom Hart in Germany and Dorothea Trudell in Switzerland. Now, Dr. Cullis was a medical doctor, and he was treating especially tuberculosis victims. And he said, well, if God will heal in Europe, I bet he'll heal here too. And um, so he had a cancer patient, actually, who had been bed fast for, I think, five months. And uh, he said to this lady, he'd been studying the Bible, building his faith up. And uh, he said to this cancer patient, had a tumor, a large tumor, And he said, you know what? He said, I've been reading the Bible, and I've been hearing about people getting healed in Europe. And uh, James 5 says that if you anoint with oil and pray the prayer of faith, the sick will be healed. And her response was not, yes, I believe. You know what her response was? Well, if you want to try it. (laughs) And uh, so he said, yeah, I do. And so he found out she, she got up later that afternoon and walked five miles. She'd been bed fat, and then she healed, got healed and recovered fully, you know, tumor disappeared. And uh, so from that point forward, he started, you know, and then in years, he said, from that day to this, nearly 20 years ago, I have prayed with tens of thousands of people suffering from all kinds of diseases, curable and incurable with the consumptive and cancerous, the rheumatic and those who had tumors of all kinds. And with many who had incurable diseases that I cannot mention, they have been healed. I could tell you, but it would take the whole night and more of some of the most wonderful of cases. You know, I'd never heard of this guy. And, uh, but he was also friends with other ministers who all testified, yeah, he's getting people healed. They, you know, these things are well documented historically. Let's jump ahead. Next slide, if we could. Um, how many of you have ever heard of Charles Spurgeon? Now, most people don't think of him being remotely charismatic or remotely, uh, but um, I, he said more than once, we were all so awestruck with the solemnity of that meeting that we sat silent for some moments while the Lord's power appeared to overshadow us. All I could do on such occasions was to pronounce the benediction and say, dear friends, we have had the Spirit of God here very manifestly tonight. Let us go home and take care not to lose his gracious influences. Charles Spurgeon knew prayer. He knew the Holy Spirit. He knew the anointing. He is called the prince of preachers. I said I've got John Wesley's complete works, and it takes about that much space on my bookshelf. I don't have the complete works of Spurgeon, but if I did, they would take this much on my bookcase about seven times over. I mean, he was prolific. And um, one of the guys, let's go to the next slide. Um, How many of you have ever heard of Temple University in Philadelphia? If you follow basketball, the Temple Owls. uh, But that was started by a Baptist pastor named Russell Conwell. 
And Russell Conwell was fascinated. He, he was the founder of Temple University. Uh, Russell Conwell was fascinated with Spurgeon, and he went over to see him. Conwell, and I have his book, he wrote a book on healing. He believed in healing and praying for the sick. And he went over and visited Spurgeon and spent time with Spurgeon. And what he found out was Spurgeon had all kinds of people healed in his church from prayer. But Spurgeon wouldn't talk about it because he didn't want to draw attention to himself. So he, Russell Conwell wrote, there are now living and worshiping in the Metropolitan Tabernacle, that's uh, Spurgeon, hundreds of people who ascribe the extension of their life to the effect of Mr. Spurgeon's personal prayers. They have been sick with disease and nigh unto death. He has appeared, kneeled by their beds, prayed for their recovery. Immediately the tide of health returned, the fevered impulse became calm, the temperature was reduced, and all the activities of nature resumed, their normal functions, functions within a short and unexpected period. And one thing that a lot of people don't know about Spurgeon, his sanctuary seated 5,000. I mean, he was, when they say he was the prince of preachers, he was famous and he was popular. And, and, and then he had people that didn't like him too. But he talks about in his autobiography, and he didn't know, he didn't call it a word of knowledge. Because in his mind, he kind of thought that the gifts of the Spirit had stopped too. But what happened is they were happening anyway. That's kind of a different twist on things. But he talks about different times when he's preaching. Now, remember, he's preaching in front of 5,000 people, and he gave examples. He said, one time I pointed up to the balcony and said, there's a young man sitting right up here. The gloves that you have in your coat pocket are not yours. You stole those from your employer, and God wants you to make it right. After the service, an usher you know, came up to Pastor Spurgeon and said, Pastor Spurgeon, do you have a minute to talk with this young man? And this young man, you know, his head's down. He said, Pastor Spurgeon, he said, I've never stolen anything before. And he said, I'm the one you're talking about, and I'm going to get these back to my employer. I'm going to make it right. And he said, and one thing, he said, Pastor Spurgeon, he said, you're not going to tell my mom, are you? <laughs> You know, and uh, he, said it, he said it would kill her if she knew I did. Another time he said, there's a gentleman over here. He said, you've got, and he, and he called out the name of the liquor that he had in his jacket pocket. And he said, God wants to set you free from that. God wants you to, you know, and he did that. And, and let's look at the next slide. He said, I can, and this is, he was talking in, in his autobiography about those examples. He said, I could tell as many as a dozen similar cases in which I pointed at somebody in the hall without having, that's a sanctuary, without having the slightest knowledge of the person or any idea that what I said was right, except that I believed I was moved by the Spirit to say it. And so striking has been my description that the persons have gone away and said to their friends, now he's quoting, you know, from Jesus and the woman at the well, come see a man that told me all things that ever I did. Beyond a doubt, he must have been sent of God to my soul or else he could not have described me so exactly. I remember one time, uh, this is when I was at the, or my fir the first church I was an assistant pastor at, and we were having a prayer meeting. And uh, we had a little bit of exhortation and just everybody was praying all over the sanctuary. And we had altar benches at this church. And I was just on the platform praying. And I looked down and there was a young man on the altar bench over here. Just, I, I couldn't see his face. He had his head down just praying, just not doing anything, you know, no physical anything. He just had his head kneeling down at the bench praying. And, and when, I, when I looked at him, I heard in my spirit, suicide and I thought what, what you know and then and I looked at him again I, I felt suicide he's he's contemplating suicide and I thought well Lord you know what what should I do about that and so I just kind of prayed and I felt like I, I probably just maybe the Lord's wanting me to go you know the Bible calls it a word of knowledge not necessarily a paragraph of knowledge with, a, with an attached instruction manual. It's just a word. 
And so I went down and knelt down beside him. And, and when he recognized that I was there, I, I said, uh, brother, can I talk to you a second? He said, sure. And I, and I found out later that was his first time at the church. He'd never been there before. And I said, uh, I, I said you know, I, I could be wrong, but I was up looking at when I saw you, I felt like the Lord impressed me uh, that, that you might be, are, are you dealing with any suicidal thoughts or, you know, thoughts about taking your life? And man, his eyes got real big and he said, I have decided to do that. And he said, I just saw this church and he said, I was going to do it early this week. And he said, uh, I saw this church, so I thought I'd just come in and give God one more chance. Wow. And, uh, so, you know, I prayed with him and, you know, and, and God broke through into his life. But see, sometimes we need these tools of being led by the Holy Spirit. And that's why I said this morning at the close of one of the services, these things are not toys for us to play with. These are tools to use in setting captives free. And, uh, you know, Charles Spurgeon, you know, honestly, he never called it a word of knowledge. Can I tell you something? It doesn't matter what you call it. It, it, what matters is that when God puts something on your heart that you follow that leading and that you, you know, work with God accordingly. So let's go on to the next slide if we can. Uh, A.J. Gordon, he was a pastor in Boston and a very intelligent man. Um, he wrote books uh, on the Holy Spirit, on healing, uh, he wrote a book on In Christ Realities. You'd think you were reading after Brother Hagen on all three of his books. Passed in 1895. But he affirmed uh, the gifts of tongues and prophecy do not seem to be confined within the first age of the church. Uh, all these people are having these awakenings that, you know, God wants to restore to the church all the, the gifts and the empowerment that the church has ever walked in. Let's skip to another, please, if we could. D.L. Moody, I, I mentioned him today. He was the Billy Graham before there was a Billy Graham. And um, he was a real powerful evangelist. And um, there were two ladies in his church uh, that he noticed were always on the front row praying. And he said to them after a service, he said, ladies, I notice you're praying. I sure appreciate that. And he said, uh, I assume you're praying for the lost to be saved. And they said, well, no, Pastor Moody, uh, we're not. And they said, well, what are you praying for then? They said, we're praying for you to have more power. <laughs> yeah, and most preachers would kind of get offended at that. But he thought, you know what? I need more power. I need more power. He was getting a lot of people saved. Um, long story short, R.A. Torrey, his associate, wrote that Moody, his church burnt down in the great Chicago fire. And he went to New York to get some funding, but he was hungry for God. He was crying out to God. And he was walking on Wall Street. Can you imagine God being on Wall Street? He was walking on Wall Street, and, it, and he said the power of God fell upon him as he walked up the street. And he had to hurry off to the house of a friend and ask that he might have a room by himself. And in that room, he stayed alone for hours. And the Holy Ghost came upon him, filling his soul with such joy that at last he had to ask God to withhold his hand, lest he die on the spot from very joy he went out from that place with the power of the Holy Ghost upon him. Now, that's what R.A. Torrey said. His associate said that about him. Booty talks about it, too, in some of his writings. But he, he said, it's so sacred to me, that moment, that experience. He said, it's really hard for me to talk about it. It was just too holy and too sacred. But can you imagine having to say, God, please pull, pull your hand off or I'm, I'm going to die from joy? Have you ever seen a death certificate that this person died from joy? I, I don't think that's ever happened. But, um, but anyway, Moody, uh, he said that from that point on, uh, he just saw the number of people getting saved multiply. Like before he might preach and five people would get saved. Well, now 25 are getting saved at these different meetings. Uh, very quickly, move ahead. We're about to wrap up. Um, A.B. Simpson, we talked about him at lunch. Uh, he's the founder of the Christian Missionary Alliance. And Simpson said, 
there appears to be no reason why this gift of tongues should not appear at any time in the history of the church. It was not always employed in the apostolic church as the vehicle of preaching to people of other languages, but rather as a channel of direct worship and adoration. In the Bible, there's three types of tongues really that are mentioned. And people get confused because they think it's all one and the same. But on the, uh, you see people, uh, that, like on the day of Pentecost, tongues was used as a means of communicating the gospel to people in their own language. That's a public version. There's another public version in the church where somebody will simply give an utterance in tongues and somebody interprets it. And that's for the edi- the first was for the reaching of the lost. The second is for the edification of the church. And the third is where Paul says, he that prays in an unknown tongue is not speaking unto men, but unto God, that when you, pr- that when you pray in the spirit, you edify yourself. So tongues is not all one and the same. There's a public version for evangelism. There's a public version for the edification of the church. And then there's a private uh, venue of tongues for personal edification. And people lost that for a long time. And people like A.B. Simpson began to recognize that. Finally, or not finally, but almost finally. Next slide. Uh, William J. Seymour. Do you know him? He's the guy that God used to spearhead one of the greatest outpourings of the Spirit in all of church history, the Azusa Street Revival. And we write about it in the book. There's more extensive writings. But but he made this statement. I love this. He said, the Pentecostal power, when you sum it all up, is just more of God's love. If it does not bring more love, it is simply a counterfeit. I saw a little thing here a while back that said it doesn't matter if you speak in tongues if you're mean in English. (laughs) So we want the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. Finally, and this is really finally, let's move on. Uh, Billy Graham, uh, I think most respected minister in American history, You say, well, why are you bringing him up at a deal for, um, you know, miracles and the supernatural? You know, he was more of a Baptist. You know, his wasn't really a ministry of healing or gifts of the Spirit. He just preached the simple gospel and, you know, that. Well, thank God for Billy Graham. But he recognized some things. Did you know he had a real strong friendship with Oral Roberts? You know, Billy Graham, I think, is undoubtedly the greatest minister in American history, especially of the 20th century, but he was kind of in that Baptist stream. Oral Roberts was in the Pentecostal stream, but those guys were buddies. And uh, uh, Oral invited Billy to be the commencement speaker when ORU, Oral Roberts University, was dedicated in 1967. And uh, I know this through some personal friends who knew uh, Oral personally, that um, they were together often, and one of the first times they were together, Billy Graham said to Oral, said, Oral, would you pray for me in other tongues? And Oral, happy to do it, prayed for him, prayed for him in the spirit, and afterwards, Oral, or Billy Graham said, thank you, nobody's ever prayed for me that way before. And every time they got together after that, Billy would always say, they'd always slip away somehow, and he'd say, Oral, pray for me in the spirit. But this is in his book, uh, the whole, Billy Graham wrote a book on the Holy Spirit, and he said, and today, when the gospel is proclaimed on the frontiers of the Christian faith, meaning, you know, people hearing the gospel who've never heard it before, Uh, that approximate the first century situation, miracles still sometimes accompany the advance of the gospel, as indicated by both the prophets Hosea and Joel, as we approach the end of the age, we may expect miracles to increase. Billy Graham expected miracles to increase. Toward the end, I know Pentecostals that are kind of nine tenths asleep and they're not expecting anything. 
They're just going through the motions. Billy Graham said, we can expect miracles to increase at the end of the age. Uh, final slide. This is our very last one. As we approach the end of the age, I believe we will see a dramatic recurrence of signs and wonders. Did you know Billy Graham said that? Get his book, The Holy Spirit, it's in there. We will see a dramatic recurrence of signs and wonders that will demonstrate the power of God to a skeptical world. Just as the powers of Satan are being unleashed with greater intensity. Can anybody say, I think that's happening? Just as the powers of Satan are being unleashed with greater intensity, so I believe God will allow signs and wonders to be performed. I'm going to tell you what, I, I opened this morning by talking about how that, you know, there's an intellectual side to Christianity, informational, uh, devotional, uh, ethical, moral, all those are wonderful and we don't want to lose any of those dimensions. But there is a supernatural component to Christianity. And we're not going to win the world just because we're smart. Just because we can quote Bible verses. Although thank God for the Bible and thank God for the power. But, but there has to be not just the word but there also needs to be the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Let's all stand up. Father, in Jesus' name, let's all lift our hands right now. And let's just come into agreement. Father, we hunger now. Lord, we see what you've been doing. That you've, you've always, in, you've worked through people, through men and women. You've worked on different continents and different parts of the world. That whenever people would open their hearts to the fullness of your spirit, you were so eager to pour out your spirit. But Father, we, we have to hunger and thirst for that. We have to desire that. We can't resist the Spirit, grieve the Spirit, quench the Spirit. Lord, we have to do exactly what Pastor Michael and Tony were exhorting earlier today. We just have to open up our lives and our hearts to the fullness of the Spirit. And Lord, in the early church, they prayed and we pray now that you would stretch forth your hand by healing folks in the name of Jesus and that, that your ministers would be given boldness to preach and to lift up that wonderful name. And Father, we just, we just ask you right now, go ahead and lift up your voices in the Spirit. Lord, we just thank you for an outpouring. Thank you for days and times of refreshing yet to come. Thank you for gifts being unleashed and operations of the Spirit uh, being poured out upon and through your church. Lord, we just thank you for a great, great uh, harvest of souls in the days to come. That, Lord, you'll make us skilled laborers in flowing in the love of God, flowing in the Word of God, flowing in the Spirit of God, and that you'll make us great uh, ministers of reconciliation, helping people being reconciled to God. And that, Lord, you'll work through us to your glory and to your honor. Father, we thank you for it. We believe that great days are ahead. And, and Lord, we're not just going to pray way out in the advance. We pray right now, right here. Lord, if there are people here right now dealing with sickness, we curse that sickness. We curse that condition. Lord, that person dealing with high blood pressure, Lord, we just curse the cause, the root cause of that. And Lord, we just thank you for healing coming into their body. That person that's been dealing with great tension in their system, anxiety in their system. Lord, flood them with the peace of the Holy Spirit right now. Do a healing work in their bodies. Lord, anybody here with growths or tumors or anything that should not be in their body, Lord, we just thank you for the power of God dissolving it, destroying that, that invader. Lord, we just thank you for uh, conditions, health conditions, 
being made normal and whole. And we expect great reports in Jesus' name. And Lord, thank you that you empower your people with the fullness of your spirit. That this is a, a people who are full of power, full of glory, full of the Holy Ghost. We thank you for it. Why don't we pray for your pastors right now? Tony and, and Michael, could you just let me pray for you guys? I'll take your hands here. You stretch. How many of you know it's important to pray for your leaders? Father, we thank you for the call of God that's so evident upon Pastor Michael and Tony. And Lord, we thank you for their obedience to follow you, to walk with you, to, to recognize your leading. And Father, we just pray for even greater wisdom. Uh, Lord, I know that they've prayed, Lord, show us what to do. Show us how to do it. And Lord, we just thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That, Lord, you'll, you'll increase the sharpness and the clarity of their focus. And that, Lord, grace, great grace will be poured out upon them and their entire team. And that, Lord, they'll not be laboring at all in the energy of the flesh, although our flesh feels it. But, Lord, they'll be, they'll be operating from the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit in all that they do. And because of the presence of your Spirit, there will be a, a, an ongoing refreshing in their lives. And Father, we thank you that they'll lead in such a way that when it's all said and done, they will know, everyone will know, that what they've done has been by the hand and the leadership of God. Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Let's lift our hands one more time and thank God for his goodness. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his presence. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Good days ahead. Come on. Just a few moments longer. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, a couple of years ago, I was standing in my backyard. And I wrote it down in a journal, but I, it just, it was this thought, and my wife will confirm this. The Holy Spirit just said, if you knew how long you had left here on this earth, would it matter? And I just wrote that down in my, in my journal, and I thought, Lord, are you taking me out? Like, what, what's, what, you know? Like, you, you, your mind just does crazy things like that. But as we were praying just now, he brought that back, and he said, pray like your lives depend on it. And I just wonder if we, pr if we shouldn't not if we should not just begin to have that mindset of urgency, like, hey, guess what? He's coming back. He's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. He's coming back for a church. I had somebody tell me one time recently that, you know, the church, the bride of Christ has to go through tribulation. So that's when the fire works out all of the, you know, the, the wrinkles. And I thought to myself, you know what? The fire has already come because the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that the, you shall be baptized with fire. And I said, you know, that's what the Holy Ghost is wanting to do. He's wanting to remove every spot or wrinkle on the inside of us. If we'll pray with urgency, how much more would we just begin to prepare our spirits uh, for, for His soon coming? And I just thought of that as we, were, as we were listening, how these men and women of God and of faith would just begin to pray with an urgency. And we just said this at, at lunch today because of the, uh, the, 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 the persecution that is happening right now in Afghanistan and around the world. And around the world, um, the Bible says in Revelation, and, and we kind of got stuck on this, but um, it, the Bible says, and they overcame the, the devil by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto death. There's urgency in that. Like, God, you're the only way out, and I'm trusting in you. And, and I think that we haven't yet prayed to that level of urgency. But I just want to end with this thought. 
Last week, I don't think it was by chance. I woke up early last week. Um, late in the week, it had been a crazy full week. We had been in meetings, uh, board meetings, board of directors meetings, and we're in that that level where you know sometimes you get into so many meetings, your mind is just jello after the end of the day. You know what I'm saying? And I just got up one early morning and I said, Holy Spirit, what do you want to pray? What do you want me to preach last week? Because I knew it was just a one time message. And this is what the Holy Spirit said: I want you to tell them to make room for the Holy Spirit. And that's what I preached. And it was incredible. The four points at the end of the message were recognize the Holy Spirit, respect the Holy Spirit, or reverence Him, receive the Holy Spirit, which was a command, and then respond to the Holy Spirit. That's what we're doing. That's what they were doing for 2,000 years, and that's what we're going to do until He comes back for us. And so I just, I just, uh, I just shout what John the Revelator shouted in, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. It's the testimony of Jesus that is the spirit of prophecy, or what will continue on in this church. As long as we say as pastors, we will never back down from allowing the Holy Spirit to do and to say what He wants to say. And I just want to say one last time. Pastor, thank you so much for coming and confirming. If for no other reason, we know this, we're on the right track, guys. Um, All over the room, one more time, just lift your hands and say, Holy Spirit, I'm reporting for duty. (laughs) What is it that you'll have me do? Who is it that you'll have me speak to? Even this week. I'm a conduit ready for your service in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Do you believe that? Then go change your world. Amen. We'll see you next. We'll see you tomorrow night.